My first guest tonight can speak with authority about the presidency of Donald Trump. In his book, The Room Where It Happened, John Bolton offers a detailed account of his 17 months as President Trump's national security advisor in 2018 and 19. Before that, he was US ambassador to the United Nations under George W. Bush. Uh, John Bolton, welcome to the day. Uh, we appear to be heading towards a presidential election uh, rematch between uh, Trump and Joe Biden. In the forward to the new paperback edition of your book, The Room Where It Happened, you say Donald Trump is unfit to be president. Why? Well, he's not competent to handle the job. He didn't know much about it when he came into office in 2017, and he didn't know very much more when he left in 2021. Certainly in the national security space, he didn't have a guiding philosophy. He didn't do policy making as we normally understand that term. He didn't appreciate the gravity uh, of the issues that confronted him. Uh, and he doesn't have any really better idea today. So at a time of increasing international difficulties, to say the least, uh, he, he is exactly the wrong person to uh, become president uh, of the United States. So is that a, an argument for another Biden presidency? <laughs> no, not at all. I don't think Biden is fit to be president either, although for somewhat different reasons. Uh, and it's very unfortunate that the country uh, is facing this choice. You know, we have polls that now show uh, up to 80 percent or more of Americans do not want to see a Biden-Trump rematch. And that, as of now, is uh, looks exactly like what we're going to get. So Trump unfit because of incompetence, Biden unfit because... Well, I don't think his policies are the right policies, and I think uh, the Democrats are whistling past the graveyard, uh, quite literally, to nominate uh, to nominate him. If he had stepped aside, I think the Democrats would have had a very active primary race for their nomination, and that actually might have helped us on the Republican side dislodge Donald Trump. Of a second Trump presidency, uh, you've written, if his first four years were bad, the second four will be worse. Trump really cares only about retribution for himself, and it will consume much of a second term. So, John Bolton, who are the likely targets of Donald Trump's retribution, and what's payback likely to look like? Well, I think given that Trump's view of uh, the presidency is a series of decisions about what benefits Donald Trump, politically primarily, but maybe economically as well, he, he will look at the people who stood in his way, his political opponents. And in uh, his world, the constitutional constraints that we have, the uh, protections for uh, dissent, uh, really uh, are not things that concern him. So he's indicated, for example, he thinks Mark Milley, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, committed treason uh, for talking to his Chinese counterpart uh, in 2020 to say that, that whatever you see on television, it's just uh, political. There's no change in the U.S. Uh, uh, military or diplomatic readiness status. Uh, Trump always used to say when I was national security advisor, he wanted to prosecute former Secretary of State uh, John Kerry for violating what we call the Logan Act, which is an old statute about not conducting a private foreign policy. Uh, and he tried to repress my book that, that you just mentioned from being published because he didn't like it saying critical things about him and his conduct in office. So there are a wide range of potential okay. targets, and I'm sure Trump will be eager to get at it. All right. Well, that's still something that, that may or may not happen. Let's look at something that, that's happening uh, at the moment, the, the, the conflict in Gaza between uh, Israel and Hamas. And the White House has been pressing Israel not to launch a ground offensive in Rafah, uh, where something like a million civilians are, are sheltering with nowhere to go. Um, what is your take on, on whether or not Israel should do this? Well, I think they're going to go ahead. I mean, when the people talk about a ground offensive, you make it sound like the Battle of the Bulge or something, when in fact most of the combat in Gaza right now is uh, being conducted in this incredible system of tunnels that Hamas dug uh, underneath what seems to be most of the Gaza Strip, uh, how many tens of millions of dollars uh, they spent on that rather than the economic betterment of the Gazan residents uh, is an interesting question, but they're holed up down there and they're trying to last the Israelis out. 
So I think that uh, the Israelis obviously have an obligation to take due concern for civilian life, but they're also free to to uh, rid themselves of the threat of Hamas terrorism. Right. So so in, in any White House uh, in which you may or may, may not serve, yours would not be one of the voices uh, uh, cautioning uh, Israel uh, to uh, be uh, to to take more care or to or to not to go into Gaza. Well, I think they did what they were entitled to do. The right of self-defense means you don't uh, respond merely by killing the number of people that uh, uh, Hamas killed on October the 7th. You're entitled to eliminate the threat. In World War II, the United States eliminated the Japanese and German threats, which we were entitled to do in our own self-defense. And as part of this elimination of threat, as, as you put it, um, Israel has uh, killed something like 30,000 civilians. Again, the White House has criticised uh, Israel uh, for going too far in its uh, response to the uh, October 7 terror attacks. Uh, the White House, uh, most countries in Europe and indeed uh, most of the global south. Um, what do you think? Has Israel gone too far? Well, I, th those are Hamas figures, uh, and it raises the question, even if 30,000 is the right number, how many do you consider Hamas terrorists and how many do you consider civilians? You know, most, most terrorists don't go around in uni uniforms, uh, and, and you, can, you can aid and abet terrorist activity in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, so I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, there's a propaganda war going on here. I think Hamas is beating Israel in the propaganda war. But I'm not sure that's a reflection of reality. So, uh, just so we're clear, uh, you don't believe that Israel has gone too far in its reaction? No. I mean, if, if you believe in the right to self-defense, you have to believe that it's permissible to eliminate a terrorist threat. Nobody should have to live with a terrorist threat on their border. And that's what the Israelis are doing. <sighs> Returning to um, Donald Trump, because one of the, the, the big issues, um, regardless of who is next in the White House, is, is the future of NATO. And a lot of European leaders have been much exercised by uh, Mr. Trump's recent statement that he would encourage Russia to do whatever the hell they want to any NATO country that doesn't meet the 2% the guidelines on defence spending. Um, was this bluster, do you think? No, I think in a second term, Trump will withdraw the United States from NATO. I describe in my book uh, the, the scene at the 2018 NATO summit in Brussels where he came within an inch of actually doing it then. Uh, so I think it's very likely he will withdraw in a second term. I think that's a catastrophic mistake uh, for the United States and, and the West as a whole. But uh, he has been able to beat the drum very effectively on the number of European countries that haven't lived up to the commitment they made voluntarily in 2014 to spend 2% of GDP on defense. Uh, uh, Trump is very transactional. He thinks in dollars and cents terms. He doesn't have a strategic vision. Uh, and, uh, and many Europeans, and I'll be honest, Canada, uh, have played right into his hands. He's, he's not urging people to spend more because he wants to strengthen NATO. He doesn't expect, ultimately, that, that most of these members will make it to 2%, and that will be the basis on which he withdraws the United States from the alliance. Right. So, the, so lacking a, a, a defense strategy, this is entirely... This, and I appreciate we're speculating, this would be entirely uh, transactional. This would not be as part of some uh, bigger strategy. This would be just because you haven't paid your money, therefore we are leaving. Well, that, and he doesn't like the trade deals that exist between the European Union and the United States. He never liked the fact that Europe was buying natural gas uh, from Russia over the Nord Stream pipeline, which I, I think was an entirely valid point. Ronald Reagan warned Europe warned Europe in the 1980s, do not become dependent on Russian oil and natural gas. Good talking to you. You've given us much to think about. Uh, former U.S. National Security Advisor, uh, Ambassador John Bolton. Thank you. Thank you.